morning. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, we are here uh, and starting the third day of uh, second full day, actually, of the ERSA Jersey uh, Winter School on uh, smart specialization, linking global challenges to local uh, implementation. And uh, um, I, I think I've heard that that, uh, that yesterday was a very nice, uh, lively, and fruitful day, uh, and I really hope that uh, today um, we're going to have uh, at least the same uh, level of experience. Uh, I'm sure that we will have uh, a very interesting uh, academic uh, lecture right now. Uh, we will start so the, this this day with uh, uh, Professor Riccardo Crescenzi. Uh, Riccardo is, uh, is a full professor of, econ of economic geography at the London School of Economics uh, and uh, uh, associate at the Center for International Development at Harvard Kennedy School of Governance and many other titles which I would not, uh, uh, I, I would not detail, uh, almost as many titles as the Queen of England. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, I would like to, to say a few words before uh, uh, letting Ricardo start uh, his, uh, uh, his lecture. Um, the topic of, the, of this morning's lecture is about recovery, smart specialization, and evidence-based uh, policies in, uh, in Europe. And uh, this is a very uh, key topic uh, nowadays. It's, uh, uh, I'll tell you, it's very high, probably the, the, the highest uh, uh, rank in the, uh, in the political agenda of the European Commission, and I would say of the European, European institutions uh, as, a, as a whole. As uh, the, the policy effort and the funding uh, orientation uh, of, uh, at European level has been and is being focused uh, in, a, in a very, uh, I would say, evident and intense way uh, on, on the issue of, uh, of recovery. So it's uh, uh, recovery it's, it is to some extent uh, the way uh, the European institutions will be judged, uh, whether they are successful in, the, in their policy making or, or they fail. Uh, and therefore, it is important for us as scientists to get a grasp on what recovery could be, where, uh, which are uh, the, the strengths and the weaknesses that we can detect right now, and uh, what kind of recommendations, what kind of findings can, we can turn into uh, input and, and recommendations uh, for the policymakers, and I would not only mention the policymakers at the European level, so my colleagues at the, at the European Commission, but also policymakers at national uh, level in the governments of the member states, and uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, our heart, I think, uh, uh, altogether is, is close to the to the territorial level. Uh, it's this is also important for uh, governments uh, in in regions and uh, and cities. So uh, I would uh, I would stop here. I would uh, uh, invite uh, uh, Ricardo to uh, take the floor. Uh, Ricardo, you have uh, around thirty five to forty minutes, and then we can take some questions from from the participants. I would kindly ask the participants if they wish if they can use the chat to. Uh, book their time for question with uh, putting uh, writing down the, the kind of questions they would like to, to put to, to Ricardo after his uh, uh, lecture. But also uh, we'll, we'll take uh, account of uh, those who would uh, raise their hand uh, when we start the, the Q&A session uh, when Ricardo uh, finishes his, his lecture. So uh, this is it, uh, Ricardo, uh, I'm very pleased to invite you to take the floor. Alessandro, thank you very much. Uh, I will not wear the crown because for the lecture is um, too heavy. Uh, so I will do without. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much. Thanks, Alessandro. Thanks to the Joint Research Center of the European Commission and thanks to ERSA, the European Regional Science Association for inviting me and giving the opportunity to uh, be part of this amazing uh, uh, winter school. I'm, I'm truly delighted to be here uh, today. Uh, I really do hope there will be opportunities for questions, for conversations in the uh, exchange moments that will follow uh, the lecture as well as after, after the lecture in the question time. So what I would like to discuss today 
is about the use of evidence uh, and, uh, and evaluation of public policies in order to guide uh, public policies, in order to see what works and what doesn't, and come up with progressively more effective medications to address uh, the big problems that in particular our regions and in particular our less developed regions face uh, on a daily basis. So this, what I will discuss is mostly about what can we learn from what we have done and how to learn from the past in order to develop a better future. Like Alessandro said, uh, learning, being effective, delivering tools that work has never been as important as it is today because we are facing an existential uh, a challenge for the European Union as a whole. And I will close my, my lecture with some numbers, uh, on, particularly on this, on, this, I, on this issue. I will try and show you how important it is to deliver, how important impact is for consensus around economic integration around uh, uh, Europe. Uh, so this will be like the key, the key topic uh, uh, that I will try and discuss. Let me share my screen now uh, uh, and uh, uh, show you some uh, um, slides that I, I hope you can see. Alessandro, say something uh, if, you, if you don't. Uh, um, so th very briefly, the, the, the structure of this, of this talk. So like I said, COVID-19, innovation and recovery. So the first like a set of issues that I would like to discuss is, okay, what is it that this crisis has highlighted? What is it that we can learn uh, in terms of what the crisis has unveiled? Uh, I will then discuss the key questions that I would like to address with you uh, in terms of learning from existing public policies. And the key questions have to do with what I will call the WWW approach. So what works, where, and we look at the case of smart specialization policies to try and answer these questions uh, as, as an example, as, as, as a case study. And then the other two Ws, when and for whom, and I will look at the case of the EU recovery fund. And like I said, I will close with some considerations on why impact matters, uh, what Alessandro was discussing about political consensus for uh, European integration, political consensus for uh, um, the policies uh, uh, that work. So like COVID-19, uh, if we go back to the uh, last year, uh, more or less like March uh, last year, there was a big problem uh, in terms of adding enough ventilators in intensive care units, uh, in particular in Lombardy, that was the first uh, European region to be heavily affected by COVID-19. And the problem was that we didn't have enough of these masks uh, for ventilators to, to work. Uh, because we have never had uh, so many uh, uh, infections of this, of, this, of, this, of this nature. And so some, uh, in particular, a, a company located in Lombardy, Sinova, came up with the idea of converting snorkeling masks into masks that are suitable for ventilators. Uh, I don't have, uh, I, I'm unable to explain you how they did it, but it has to do with the yellow part at the top, with the valve that you see at the top. And the same company designed, uh, uh, put all the instructions, all the specifications for the development of the new valve online uh, so that people could download it and 3D print the valve everywhere in the world so that they could learn from the experience uh, that they have developed in Lombardy to convert as many of these very cheap masks into ventilators as possible. I think it's a uh, just an example of how the response to COVID-19 has offered uh, opportunities for innovations in various regions, uh, in various sectors, and across different types of technologies. Example of this, like I mentioned before, the development and the 3D printing, that is an important part of the story, of the innovative valves to convert simple snorkeling masks into ventilators for intensive care units. But also, if you think about, if you, if you think about the past year, the enormous technological and organizational effort of firms, including small and medium enterprises, for a, trans for a successful transition into work from home regimes. Working from home for such an extended period, although it doesn't involve like the large majority of firms, differently from our experience, uh, uh, work from home is still like not a uh, like 
as a common experience as we are used to think about it, but still firms all over Europe, including firms in less developed regions that moved from working uh, through face-to-face -face contacts into a work from home regimes had to make substantial changes in the way in which they are organized, in which they organize their work stream, they organize their workforce, they monitor their workforce, et cetera, et cetera. So this involved a major organizational uh, innovation. So product innovation, process organizational innovation, Think about the vaccine. Think about the, the tense at this moment of vaccines that have been developed in such a short period of time. An incredible international collaborative effort that also involves strong, st strong collaborations between universities and industries located in a variety of regions in Europe. The Oxford vaccine uh, developed in Oxford will be mass produced uh, uh, in Belgium, is gonna be a part of, of the development of the so-called so prototypes of the vaccine and be developed uh, in uh, uh, Pomezia, south of Rome, uh, a former uh, a less developed area uh, in, in Europe, objective two uh, area. So it's, it, I think it's, it's incredibly interesting to see how COVID-19 has been a major challenge uh, for regions in Europe, but also has shown the enormous capacity uh, of regions, uh, uh, sectors, uh, and firms to react with innovative ideas. These examples, the, the three like apparently uh, unrelated examples that, that I mentioned, and we could mention more, have in common two key enablers. The first is, cross-country collaborations and open borders. And part of it is really uh, uh, shows the strength of the EU uh, uh, system of innovation and how we can collaborate across countries, across regions in uh, a virtually seamless fashion. Uh, the, the example of the snorkeling master that I mentioned before, the company received significant uh, uh, funding uh, for research from the European Union before all this happened. But this is an example of how funding for research and the same for the company in Pomezia that is uh, that worked on the on the prototypes of, 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 of the vaccine was is a great beneficial and will be one of the companies uh, in the study that they will discuss before uh, having to do with, with smart specialization projects uh, is uh, uh, are important examples of how international collaborations plays a key role uh, in fostering innovation however they also involve supportive innovation ecosystems conditions at the supranational national and regional level that made it is innovation possible. And of course, this supportive ecosystem, the things that make innovation possible also involve fundamentally public policies. Public policies at the three levels that I mentioned before, supranational, the EU level, the national level, and the local level. And this is what I like to focus on. Okay, what can public policy do to make these examples, to make these opportunities more the norm? How can we react to the consequences of COVID-19 that might undermine the enablers that I mentioned before, because international collaboration, global economic integration seems to be uh, uh, in, in retreat because we are more and more fragmented in our own national countries, even when discussing about uh, how to distribute the doses of the vaccine. And the innovation system and the innovation ecosystem is under increasing pressures for scarce resources. So the key problem becomes how to keep the window of opportunity open that COVID-19 has paradoxically allowed us to uncover, to, to, to discover the strength of, of, of many regions and many sectors, but how to spread opportunities, how to make sure that we, as, as the Commission is proposing, we can rebuild better. And so there are two key points. Okay, when we face a problem, we have learned uh, uh, this with the, with the, when dealing with the pandemics, well, there, there is the level of the diagnosis. We need to understand what the problem is. What is it that allowed some place to be successful and other not to be so successful? And then what is the cure, if any cure is available? So how can we use public policies to cure, to get rid of the bottlenecks that make it impossible or make it difficult for firms located in certain regions to be as successful as the firms located in other regions? So what I will argue is that in terms of diagnosis, we are really like in good track. So we, uh, uh, we have a large scholarly and, and, and policy literature on how regions work. It is a very dynamic field of research in economic geography, regional economics, urban planning. 
uh, that has been really able over the past uh, 20 years to understand the mechanics of regions. So to understand like how the body of regions really work. Um, and, and, and it's really significant probably since the Barca report, how policymaking uh, has been able to take on board the state of the art of, of academic work. Smart specialization is, is, is an example of public policies like taking on board uh, 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 the work by Dominique Fauré and, 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 and others. So it's taking on board and, and being listened in terms of our diagnosis of how regions work and how the body works, what is the, 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 the physiological uh, mechanisms uh, inside the bodies of regions. It's, it, it's really something that uh, uh, we are on, on, on track. On top of that, the, 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 the quality of our uh, data has been increasingly uh, improving, constantly improving. We have today data uh, available that we could even, uh, couldn't even dream about uh, just uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 years ago uh, or 15 years ago when I was writing my PhD, I could uh, not even imagine the data that are available now that you can just go and, 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 and download from a website. So that what we can do today is develop very, very accurate diagnosis of the situation of regions, of the potential bottlenecks, of, of the problems the regions face when dealing with innovation, when dealing with uh, regional development more broadly. Let me summarize this with uh, two graphs. This is my own work so that I can uh, uh, criticize uh, uh, freely. So what we have learned is that when, we, when it comes to innovation, that in innovation like pays off in terms of uh, R&D investments, investing in innovation pays off in very different ways, depending on how innovative your region is already. So in this plot, you can see the coefficients, the rate of return to your investments in R&D in terms of the generation of new patents. That is a very crude measure for, for innovation. So this tells you for each euro that you invest in R&D, how much patents you get in return. So this is so, as having like a continuous distribution of the coefficients of regression coefficients that link how much you spend with how much innovation you get out in response of your expenditure. And here in the graph, you can see that for relatively low levels of expenditure, so less developed regions, the returns in terms of innovation output for your investments are zero. There are very low returns. And they start becoming positive when you go above the 2% threshold. Then they are rapidly increasing. So this shows that the same euro invest in innovation, invest in different regions have very different returns. The most paradoxically, if you want, the most innovative regions offers the highest returns to additional investments in innovation. That this contradicts what we normally expect for capital investments, where we expect decreasing marginal returns for capital investments. If I put the first computer on your table, then you become a lot more productive. But if I put 20 computers on your table, then the returns are decreasing. The, 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 the 20th or the 21st computer really kills your productivity. Instead, when it comes to innovation, the more I invest in the same region, the more output I get, the more productive the additional euro is. So, and, and I think we have learned this relatively well, that, that less developed regions face a structural disadvantage in terms of their returns to their investments in innovation. At the same time, this is the second graph. We know that human capital has a much more uh, a rate of return uh, to, uh, um, in terms of additional innovation. You, we, we can see that uh, when we go uh, above the approximately 25% of people with tertiary education, the return to an additional, additional investments in human capital are positive and rapidly increasing. So the more educated people I can attract or uh, create in my region, the more they generate additional innovation at a rate that is progressively increasing. So we, we, this is, I think, a summary of, of, of a lot of the literature, and we know these things relatively well. We also know that the two things are combined, that we need human capital and R&D together to maximize our returns to R&D investments. Uh, here we can see this like represented 3D, that they, these are the, the, on the K-axis, the innovation output, R&D expenditure uh, on the X and, and human capital uh, uh, on the X2. And you can see, so HK, and you can see that only where you have both high level of R&D and high levels of human capital that you get the highest returns in terms of innovation. 
uh, as measured by patterns. So we do need the two things to work together. We know the, the ingredients uh, that we need to put together. And we also know that less developed regions having less of both inputs struggle the most. Because if you only have, even if you achieve like an increase in one of the inputs, given that you don't have the complementary one, you really struggle to see the returns. So we, we, we know very well this, this diagnosis, but then how, how can we bring in uh, uh, more human capital? How can we bring in more R&D investment and successful ones to the regions that are less innovative? The cure. So what about those that are not innovative? About the cure, we are much less secure. We are much less prepared. There is more limited attention, if you want, on how regional innovation work, how regional innovation policies work in practice and where. It's a relatively more recent field of research, but it is still difficult to draw like general conclusions and tell, okay, there is a silver bullet, or at least what are the, the medications, the set of medications, then depending on the characteristics of the patient, we can use successfully. We have experimented a lot. Um, we have learned a lot, but still we know much less vis-a-vis -vis the, the, our diagnostic path. So we are good at the diagnosis, but much less effective in terms of saying, okay, of in developing medications that work. And, and the, this recalls uh, uh, a lot uh, our current uh, situation with the pandemic. Now we are good at testing, uh, but provided that we, we do test, uh, that is uh, in our example, measuring uh, outcomes, building uh, data sets, but then the cure still uh, uh, we are lagging behind. But we do have some uh, uh, best practices in terms of testing, in terms of collecting data, not only about the regions, but about public policies, about the characteristics of the policies that we are implementing in terms of expenditure patterns, in terms of beneficiaries, in terms of non-beneficiaries, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, an, an interesting example in this regard is Open Coesione uh, in, in Italy that made available as an open source uh, uh, data set uh, beneficiary level uh, information that allows really to see like what type of policies with what characteristics have been implemented uh, uh, in all possible uh, contexts uh, with uh, EU uh, cohesion policy funds. So like I said, very sophisticated diagnosis. One can show fancy 3D graphs, not matched by well-test medications. So regions, based on, 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 on these results, basically on what we know about the diagnosis, have been told, and very rightly so, of course, to invest more in innovation, to improve and increase their human capital, to reinforce their institutions. The key problem is that if all regions were good at this kind of thing, these problems wouldn't exist in a first instance. Okay, if I knew how to improve my institutions, then I probably I would not have the problem uh, of, of bad institutions uh, in a first instance. It's not that I enjoy being less developed or lagging behind or being unemployed. So the key problem is like we know these things are important, but we don't know how to fix them when they are not working. So very often generic recipes have been cover-ups for rent seeking by local elites, because if I get a very general, so I give you money to improve your institutions. If I am an incumbent, I'm part of the local elite of the local government. I might take this as an opportunity to get funding for my own projects, for my own companies or for my own electoral supporters, vis-a-vis -vis having a very clear like policy targeting, a very clear identification of the priorities of the tools that work, this would reduce the discretionary power of, of, of local elites. So we really need to tackle this issue. We really need to understand more what I called our WWWW problem. What works where, when, and for whom. Um, how to achieve this goal in practice, given local conditions? This is the, the fundamental question. And I will try to discuss some, not the solution, because I don't have any solution. I want to discuss with you, and I think that's the purpose of, uh, of, 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 of this winter school, really, uh, uh, to um, see, okay, how can we reflect about the problem to inform your own research, your own thinking uh, about, about this set, this set of, um, of problems. Uh, how to do this? Well, I, I think this is mostly about theory-driven empirical work. So we need the theory, we need a diagnosis, we need to have an idea of what, are, what is the mechanics, what are the, the, the fundamental economic laws that explain how our regions work, but then we need solid empirics on 
re leveraging real policy data. So the what has been done, what is it that we are doing, how, with what characteristics that needs to meet uh, a minimum set of quality requirements in terms of falsifiability and reproducibility. So that our results, like uh, our uh, um, uh, uh, um, medication uh, regulators want to see, want to see the numbers. I want to see how you test the vaccine, on how many people, with what type of side effects. I want all the numbers before approving uh, the medication for the vaccine for rollout in Europe. The same. We, we know very well what are the minimum standards that we need to set for evidence to be valid to be really informative. And so we need more work based on, 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 on patients that have been treated with our medications in order to develop evidence that meets minimum quality requirements to guide our decision to deploy a certain instruments or not. And it, this is a, a really an exercise that involves leveraging complementarities between different streams of research. It's not only about quantitative analysis, it's really uh, about also qualitative assessment of outcomes that might be very difficult to measure, to uh, assess uh, quantitatively. So it's a, it's, it's a very complex exercise, but definitely a crucial one. Um, I will just briefly discuss with you two examples. Uh, one on what works and where, uh, leveraging the case of a sort of archetypical smart specialization policy uh, implemented uh, uh, in Italy, and then uh, something about uh, uh, when and for whom discussing about the EU recovery fund. So what works well? Let me discuss like the example of what we called uh, a smart specialization forerunner program. Um, of course, it is it is too early for like rigorous counterfactual evaluations of actual like smart specialization policies implemented in the 2014-2020 uh, programming period. Uh, in many countries, most of the expenditure for the 2014-2020 programming period happened as it is normal uh, towards the end of the programming period itself. So it's very hard to see like the impacts on beneficiaries, on firms, for example, is too soon for for any assessment. Uh, we still don't even have data for 2020 as far as many, many firm level outcomes are involved. And then COVID-19 will make it very difficult to develop reliable evaluations, given that it's such a huge structural break that it is difficult to see if something didn't work in the policy or something, something happened, for example, to beneficiary firms because of the huge COVID-19 shock. So, a possible way to learn and to see, okay, what works? What are the tools that really worked in practice is to look at the past. And what we did is we looked at the, in an historical experiment, we analyzed what are called S3 forerunner programs uh, from the past and try to learn from them. So programs that very much looked like smart specialization type of interventions before the smart specialization was launched in 2014, 2020. It's not that the experience was developed from scratch. There was uh, debate and attempts going on uh, in different European countries. And with uh, Guido de Blasio at the Bank of Italy and Mara Giua at the University of Roma 3, we looked at one particular case. We uh, tried to evaluate the impact of a particular scheme called Collaborative Industrial Research, uh, CIR, that supported innovative activities of firms located in less developed regions in Italy with 1 billion euros. So it's the largest uh, in, uh, program to support innovation implemented in Italy in the 2007-2013 programming period um, to support innovation in less developed regions. So it's a, it's a very huge uh, scheme with very substantial funding, 1 billion euros. Uh, that was co-financed by the EU cohesion policy. And the interesting feature of this program is that it anticipates, it anticipated some of the key features of the smart specialization policy programs, a, a number of key features. So of, although um, it had some different features, there was not like an open, for example, entrepreneurial discovery process in the way in which we know it with current smart specialization programs. But for example, the sectors selected for the intervention in 2007, 2013 are exactly the same that have been selected through the process of entrepreneurial discovery uh, for the program that inherited this funding under the smart specialization framework in Italy in 2014, 2020. So we think it's, 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 it's a, a good uh, uh, case study to try and learn something from the past. And the key questions that we try to address differently from uh, the standard policy evaluation literature that has been mostly interested in a zero-one evaluation. So does it work or not? 
And very often the result has been, okay, nothing works. So instead, what we, have, we are really interested in, given that we need to do something about less developed regions and innovation in, in less developed regions, is, okay, what are the features? What are the characteristics? What is it that works best in these programs? So we wanted to look at the feature of, S, of these archetypical ST programs that work best in the most disadvantaged regions of the EU. This is the fundamental question. Because a lot of the ideas that also went into the smart specialization framework came from the most successful cases in Europe, Sweden, uh, um, Denmark, uh, part of the UK. So the, really the, the, the most successful, most innovative places. But how about testing these ideas in practice in less developed regions, in less developed regions like uh, South and Italy? This is what we try to achieve, to achieve, to see okay, what features of these programs really work best in the less developed regions where the, the, the problems are really of a completely different magnitude as we have seen in our previous graphs vis-a-vis -vis what happens in the most advanced regions. And what is the impact and value added of some of the new features uh, introduced into regional innovation strategies by smart specialization. Are some of these features giving extra returns or not? So these were the fundamental questions that are not the traditional questions that you find in the evaluation literature. We are not interested in judging the impact of the program uh, as it was uh, uh, implemented, but more in trying to learn something for uh, the future, learn something for to inform current policy making. So what we did, and I think this might be helpful also for the uh, PhD students uh, uh, among you, is to collect very detailed the um, open cohesion data set that I mentioned before, a unique collection of detailed program level and firm level data. Uh, so we had information on applicants, so all firms that apply to receive funding under the uh, industrial research program, not only the successful ones, all applicants. We got access to the selection scores, so how were these beneficiaries ranked, how their project ranked, what score was given them by the evaluation committee, and then information on the actual payments to the beneficiaries, and information on firm level characteristics and performance. This implied combining five different data sets from the data sets on uh, um, the, 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 the selection procedures and the scores, to the beneficiaries, to the firm level characteristics, to their outcomes. Then we use the regression discontinuity design approach to assess the extent to which the funds have been impactful or not in terms of a number of firm level outcomes. And the R&D, the RDD approach leveraged the fact that some projects were eligible, so we're good enough to be funded. Okay, you don't want to compare projects that have been funded with projects that have uh, firms that have not been funded because there may be something intrinsically different in their characteristics that explains the differential performance of the two types of firms as well as their ability to develop a high quality project. So what we focus on are firms that were eligible, so that submitted projects of a quality that was judged high enough to be funded, but that were not funded completely by accident. The Italian government ran out of money during the funding decisions linked with the, this particular call. So some firms were eligible, had a score that was high enough to be funded, but just because the, the government ran out of money, we are not funded, we are not in receipt of funding. And this is what we use as our control group to see firms that were good enough to submit a high quality product just compared with firms that submitted similar projects, similarly ranked projects, but that received funding. So this forms like our treatment, people that get the vaccine, that get the medication, that receive the funding, and people that were eligible to receive the medication had conditions in everything similar to those that did receive the medication, but were not in receipt of the funding for a completely exogenous reason, the lack of funding at the national level. Uh, and we focus on project level heterogeneity. We want to see, okay, what are the features of the projects? And we focus on the features that mimicked what then became smart specialization to see what features give a higher return in terms of uh, firm level outcomes. Uh, we focus on a number of characteristics 
and we assess their impacts in terms of additional investments by the firms. So have beneficiary firms being investing more? That was part of the of the objectives of the of the project to invest more in new technologies. Are they generating more value added? So are they becoming more productive? Going on, going up in terms of the value that they add to their products, and are they hiring more people? Is there an effect in terms of their employment? And we looked at uh, six key like dimensions of the project. So we are not interested in a zero one. Does the, the was the uh, program successful or not? But we want to see if, for example, the presence of a university in the project partnership was uh, giving some extra returns, was making the treatment, was making the participation into the program more impactful. Collaboration, having a, a, a partnership, being forming a group of firms. Uh, focusing on advanced activities, so high tech uh, in terms of activities, not sectors, or low tech uh, in terms of, of sectors in this case, um, focusing on the most innovative firms in the less developed regions of the pattern the, the most, and then the internationalization, the involvement of multinationals in the partnership. So co collaboration uh, with research centers, for example, was not shows, shown to increase uh, the, the output uh, of the of the project at the firm at the firm level, and and having large partnerships, for example, was shown to decrease the value added and employment of firms dealing with uh, and having to do with large partnerships. This is also consistent with the number of interviews that we run in parallel with this project, uh, having to do with many partners in dealing with your innovation project. It's something that was com considered very inefficient uh, for for the firms themselves. So. The, 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 there is a key message uh, here. Firms in less developed regions might not necessarily need to collaborate with universities. They might, but not when they are forced to as a requirement of the program. They might prefer to work in relatively smaller groups. And sometimes um, there, uh, most of the impact is concentrated in more traditional activities. Uh, rather than the fancy, like high tech type of activities that many like policymakers want and, and like as their flagship projects. So what we found most of the impact is not in ICT, for example, or in biotechnologies that, as you can imagine, in less developed regions are not really sometimes the, the local uh, competitive advantage, but in more traditional activities, in innovation, in industrial innovation, but in more traditional activities, for example, in agro-industrial systems or innovation in cultural heritage activities. This is where we observe the highest returns. So again, here we can learn how we can better tailor the programs and their features, the requirements uh, for the beneficiaries to local conditions in order to maximize impact. So this is a possible way in which we can look at the past, evaluate the past, but to learn something for the future or now to maximize the returns when we launch a new call, uh, we know what type of features are more likely to give us the highest possible returns. So this example came from smart specialization. I really want to very briefly discuss with you something that has to do with the recovery fund, something like a big challenge, like Alessandro mentioned at the beginning that we are dealing as of now. Uh, at once the questions, okay, when? When is the impact going to materialize? When we are dealing with recovery and with the recovery fund, we don't want impacts to materialize in 20 years. Okay, the, the long term is important, but we are facing with an existential crisis for Europe today. People are losing their jobs today. People are facing the consequences of the pandemic today. So understanding when impacts are of, of any public intervention are likely to materialize is incredibly important. And also for whom, who are going to be the beneficiaries? Who is gonna benefit? Are these the most affected people from the pandemics or others? We, we need to, to know when we select a project, when we launch a call, who, is, who are going to be the, the most likely beneficiaries, Low, learning from the past, and when, when are the impacts going to materialize? So th this is, these are the questions that we try to address in a new paper that is going to be released at the end of this uh, uh, week uh, uh, with Mara Giua at the University of Roma Tre and Giulia Sonzogno uh, at the GSSI. Um, this focus on the recovery plan. I don't need to introduce the recovery plan, next generation EU that Alessandro mentioned, but this is like a huge effort by uh, uh, the European Commission to support recovery in all regions and all member states. So how can we guide this big effort? 
And the way in which we try to help is by looking at what we have done in the past again. And we started from the idea that from expenditure under the EU cohesion policy, we have like a lot of experience, a lot of things that have been tried and tested in uh, 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 the EU member states. And so we said, okay, what is it that we can learn uh, from, uh, from, from the past? Because some of the programs that were implemented under the EU cohesion policy in the past had exactly the same objectives highlighted in the new COVID-19 uh, uh, response program called the Next Generation EU, exactly the same objectives. So cohesion policy, the huge experience uh, developed by cohesion policy can work as a laboratory to detect and anticipate possible weaknesses of the soon to be programs implemented under the Next Generation EU and guide the selection of, of the programs. So what we did, we looked at individual projects, again from the Italian database Open Coesione that offers uh, hundreds of characteristics of the projects that have been implemented and try to select the projects that look more like the projects to be funded under the priority of next generation EU. So what we call next generation EU style projects. And we try to see what is their likely timing of, of implementation. Next generation EU, we focus on health, we focus on schools, with focus on public administration and firms. So what we try to do is to identify projects in the past that pursued similar objectives. So what we did is look using all the characteristics of the projects at projects that look very much like the ones that we are now discussing for funding under Next Generation EU. And by looking at this very simple descriptive statistics, what works now, what the question when, we can see that, for example, looking at the 2014-2020 period, so a programming period that is finished, only 8.1% of the projects funded under the EU cohesion policy targeting health are completed. When it comes, for example, to project, projects targeting the public administration, only 10%. When it comes to firms, to project targeting firms as beneficiary, 29%. So on average, the total of the programs that look like pro-recovery, it looks like what we are discussing the, the regard the, the, our new priorities, only 35% are really completed. Vis-a-vis 73% -vis of other, all other EU cohesion projects. So it is very likely that the projects that we are going to select, given the priorities of next generation EU, are pro programs that are twice as likely to be delayed, twice as likely not to be completed on time, after six or seven years. So this is a major challenge. We need to reflect and carefully look at the characteristics of projects that have been implemented in the past to see how likely are the new projects to be completed at least on time, to be completed in line with the expectations that this doesn't mean that we will produce an impact uh, 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 on time. This tells nothing about the impact, but at least if the project is really not finished, for sure it will not produce an impact. So it's a very good like forecasting method to try and, 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 and say something about the likely timing of the projects that we are selecting under Next Generation EU. This is really like working on the characteristics of, of, of public policies. Like when, uh, where, and we can also see that this type of projects are more likely to work are more likely to be applied for in the most advanced regions. Uh, if we look at Italy, they are much more likely in the north, the most advanced part of the country, vis-a-vis -vis the south. So also, when we think about, okay, for whom, who are going to be the beneficiaries of the programs that have to do with health, schooling, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, and uh, sustainability, much more likely to see beneficiaries in the north. Age. We say we want recovery to be for the young people, to be for next, the next generation. But if we look at the average age of the beneficiaries of programs that look like what we are going to do with, uh, with next generation EU, the average age is 48, while the average for all EU cohesion policy funds is 32. So on average, these type of projects being more sophisticated, being more complicated, require more senior uh, beneficiaries. And only 27% of the beneficiaries of this type of projects are female. So this is not being critical, but it's really like developing tools to make things work better. Let me just conclude 
Uh, this is like a picture that I will remember forever in my life. This is the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson on March the 12th, 2020, uh, with his advisors, uh, chief medical officer and chief scientific advisor, telling that COVID-19 will need to spread around the population in order to achieve herd immunity. This was their approach, their scientific approach to COVID-19. Scientists all over the world were very clear, never in history, herd immunity has been achieved without a vaccine. And herd immunity without a vaccine means thousands of deaths, means an enormous toll in terms of lost lives. And this is exactly what we are seeing now. The UK is by far the country that is faring the worst in terms of excess deaths from COVID-19. This is just an example of ill-advised non-evidence-based public policy making. So what we try to do by using evidence, by learning from the past, what happened with all other pandemics, or with all other viruses to inform public policies is to make evidence-based decisions that we really avoid uh, repeating the big mistakes uh, from, uh, from the past. Um, does it matter? So the, does the WWW approach matter? Yes, I think it does. Uh, when we studied uh, vote for Brexit in the Brexit referendum, what we found comparing very similar regions, so again, using a border approach, comparing regions in receipt of EU funds and regions not in receipt of EU funds, but with very similar structural characteristics, what we learned is that what matters to, for people to support the EU is not how much you spend. People, it's not true. People do not want to be bribed into the process of European integration. People want to see impact, want to see real change in their material conditions of life. And when people see change, when people feel that they are better off, then they are supportive. We do see a differential impact coming from EU expenditure, from EU intervention, but only where people have seen change, in this case, in employment opportunities in their local economy. So impactful policies, learning from the past, not only save lives, but is the, in, in my view, the only way to save Europe and give the next generation a Europe and a European Union that works. Um, thank you. Uh, just a, a little bit of advertisement. Uh, we have an LSE blog called Global Investments and Local Development that debates these issues uh, on a daily basis. So if you are on a, 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 a monthly basis, so if you are interested, please uh, uh, check our uh, uh, blog. If you have like any follow-up questions, please do use the um, uh, chat function. Um, as Alessandro mentioned, now you will uh, be able to join the, uh, the group. But if you have any second thoughts or there is anything that you want to discuss uh, in the future uh, regarding this work, uh, you are more than welcome to get, uh, to get in touch with me at any time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ricardo. This was an amazing uh, lecture. Uh, I think you, you, you got it right to the point. Uh, maybe not so much reassuring at the very end. <laughs> Uh, but still very important uh, as a message. So it's, it's impact that matters. It's not uh, just the money. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then uh, thanks for, for having uh, linked uh, uh, a bit more, more general uh, uh, statements and, uh, and findings with uh, concrete examples of, of how we as scientists can really contribute to better policy, more effective uh, policy, more impactful policies in the uh, in the future, which is a very close future and not a not a uh, far away uh, issue. It's uh, it's actually a question of acting now and acting now efficiently and, and effectively. So thanks a lot, uh, Ricardo. It was a pleasure to, to listen to you. Uh, I am now uh, looking at the participants. Uh, so I, I noticed that you, you have not really followed up on my suggestion to write your questions in the chat uh, during uh, Ricardo's presentation. But uh, uh, I would, uh, we, have, uh, we have a few minutes to, to take some, some questions. Please raise your hands first uh, and, and uh, uh, if you have questions and we, we can we, take we, them. There is a question, Alessandro, in the chat. Yeah, there is one. Okay.
Okay, so let's uh, let's take the uh, the first one in the question uh, uh, in the chat. Uh, have you looked at the effect of company support programs as a whole, or is it in the context of different countries or regions of Europe? It's uh, Kirill who uh, put the question. Kirill, would you like to to say a few words on this? Uh, Yes, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, we're trying to do the same research in Russia. So we have uh, quite, uh, I don't know, equal uh, programs, internalization, cooperation, and so on. And now we are trying to do the same work, actually. We have a company data set. We have a patent information about these companies, uh, about the support they received about the date, uh, so we're trying to do the same. And uh, now uh, I want to uh, clarify the directions. So did you uh, assess this uh, effect without a territorial breakdown or maybe in context of some regions or countries? Because it's also very interesting in context of regional economy and so on. Absolutely. Um, basically, what we did in this case is that the, the program was making firms eligible only if they were located in less developed regions, because oh. this is a, a prerequisite for eligibility under the funding from the EU cohesion policy. So we didn't take a priori a territorial approach, but firms to be eligible had to be located in less developed regions, although Part of the program was also giving uh, extra points for collaboration between more advanced and less developed regions. So we could also assess this dimension. What happens if you try and give incentives through the policy, if you give extra points uh, for collaborative projects between less developed and more advanced regions? Uh, in terms of research design, I think uh, you, you, you can look at all firms and then use the territorial characteristics as one of the heterogeneity dimensions. So you can say, okay, this is the overall impact, but how this impact vary if I only look at the subsample, for example, of less developed of firms located in less developed regions or located in more uh, advanced regions, provided that you have like enough observations to split the sample, because the problem with Russia is that you have a strong like special concentration in a, a few specific hotspots, yes. but you can still think about like some sort of uh, uh, criteria. You can say, okay, do I want to include Moscow and its regions or not, etc., uh, etc. Et so there, there are ways. I, I wouldn't like start regional, but I would start firm level, and then you can look at different possible aggregations to see where is that impact is stronger or weaker. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for the presentation. It was uh, really helpful for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kirill and, and Ricardo. I would take, uh, uh, we have a couple of more questions in the chat, and then I see uh, Fatima also has raised her hand. So let's take uh, a question from Federico Fantecchi. Uh, it's about uh, um, econometrics and machine learning tools, whether these tools can be employed to perform um, uh, I would say analysis in the context of the EU regional policy planning. So, uh, Federico, maybe would you like to say a few words on this, uh, on your question? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. So, first of all, thank you, Ricardo, for this fair and very nice lecture you gave us. So, uh, I was wondering what's, what's your take about modern econometrics, let's say, especially using machine learning tools? Because with the amount of data we have today, I believe is really, or at least we are really close to be able to perform example forecasting models and forecasting analysis in order to understand what kind of impact the, the policies we enact would have on the territories. And the big part is that we would be able to do that example before enacting same policies. And so my real question is, how do you believe if this is, has a chance to be implemented in the EU regional policy planning and how it should work to be implemented in it. Thank you. Thank you, Federico. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think this is a, a very good point. And definitely, uh, I, I, I do think that uh, machine learning tools are incredibly important uh, when making uh, um, uh, public policy decisions. Of course, we cannot 
automate the public policy process because there is a very important political input. There is a very important element of understanding and guiding the process. We cannot allow the past to be the, the only point of reference when making public policy decisions. And we, like I mentioned, uh, we also need um, to put in place a process of policy learning. So we need to create, to embed into the, so the, the machine learning is a device that can give us, uh, as uh, decision makers, analysts, uh, additional knowledge tools, uh, can allow us to forecast uh, the, the potential impacts of certain decisions, uh, to see what is more likely to generate impacts, what is less likely to generate impacts, et cetera, et cetera. So this is an incredibly powerful tool that should be used much more than uh, we are currently doing. And there is a problem of, of, of culture, of developing. And I think this, this winter school is, is an example of how we can train uh, the next generation of decision makers, of analysts to understand these tools and make use of these tools. Uh, um, so this is incredibly important, but this is only part of one part of the story, because then this is part of the information toolkit that we have available together with a, a, a more traditional evaluations of what happened in the past. And, and, and this needs to be embedded into the decision making process. So we need to design uh, governance structures that allow us to take on board this uh, uh, new information, as well as to experiment on uh, a small scale basis. So this is what we have learned. Let's try. Let's implement it on a small scale. Let's see what lessons we can learn. Let's go back if it doesn't work, or given the new problems that we understand, let's go back to the whiteboard. So we need to create uh, uh, circles of policy learning and policy learning mechanisms at all levels so that we can learn and then we can improve policies with different iterations and change policies because then something happens, COVID-19 happens, we cannot wait uh, uh, to have the perfect information set to make decisions. So we will need to adjust things very quickly. And this is something that the commission is learning um, as well, how we learned from with the, with the, with the uh, uh, 2009 crisis, how to change, for example, the use of cohesion policy tools to deal with resilience, recovery uh, of, of a crisis. So policies are becoming uh, more and more flexible in this regard. We need to make sure that flexibility does not become something in the hands of the elites uh, to uh, uh, give resources to uh, uh, interest groups or to incumbents, people that are already strong uh, in the regional economy, but to serve the interests of the, of the majority of the population by generating impacts. So uh, machine learning is a very powerful tool. We should be doing more, but we should also create the institutional and governance devices to embed uh, information in our uh, daily, on, on, on policy making on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. Sorry uh, for jumping uh, right down. I'm checking. I'm checking time. That's why uh, I am a bit. Uh, I'm a bit anxious. Uh, I would like to take the, the two the two questions left. One is uh, uh, coming from uh, Alessandro Gardelli. It's in the chat, and it's about uh, uh, the recovery funds constraint in in green expenditure and whether the uh, the database of projects that you have analyzed, uh, Ricardo had, uh, at least the analysis that you that you made had this uh, uh, kind of environmental feature uh, included. Uh, so, Alessandro, would you like to, to say a few words about this? Please be concise. Hello, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. You don't look muted, but we cannot hear you. No, maybe we can uh, we can take uh, Fatima's questions now, and then and we can we... go back to Alessandro. So can, you, can you hear me now? Oh can no, you hear yes. Me? yes. Now we can we can hear you. Sorry. Okay. Fatima. Uh, okay. okay, Alessandro, just go. Uh, I, I will be I will be very fast. So uh, thank you so much, Ricardo, for your presentation. It was very inspiring. So I was just wondering, due to this novelty of the of the recovery funds uh, constraint of thirty seven percent of green expenditure, if uh, there was a, there was a strong uh, a strong environmental features also in the projects uh, that you analyze, because this could be uh, some kind of uh, difference and. and also, a very, a very, very fast question. Uh, uh, can you, uh, wh what is your opinion on, on the on, on the policy design of the current uh, Italian government, even if it does not exist now, but the, the recent work of the Italian government 
if it included this kind of experimental literary driven uh, analysis in the recovery planning. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alexandro. Uh, very quickly, yeah, I mean, it, it, the, we couldn't assess, of course, like the environmental impacts of, of the projects. What we were focused on is the timing. So how and to what extent policies that have those priorities, programs that have the, the next generation EU type of priority are more or less likely to be at least finished on time vis-a-vis -vis the average program implemented under the EU cohesion policy for in a framework. And what we find is that the environmental, the sustainability touch that is very important for its consequences given by next generation EU is, however, more likely to lead to delays in the implementation of the projects. So this is, this is a big challenge. This is not to say that sustainability is, is, is not important. On the contrary, we sh but we should be aware of what other characteristics of the projects on how we should maybe simplify or select the beneficiary in such a way that can allow us to reconcile the objective of achieving a, a more sustainable future with the objective of fostering recovery when it is needed the most, that is, as soon as possible, uh, uh, given the, the, the challenges that EU is facing. So yes, we definitely, of course, this, the, there is nothing that we can say about the wider impacts, but we can only focus on the timing. And the title of the paper is Mind the Clock. So it, it, it's mostly about the, the, the timing of, of the projects. On the Italian government uh, approach to the recovery fund, uh, um, well, uh, I, I, I'm not sure the, the way in which the government has been dealing with the issue is uh, what I would call an evidence-based uh, uh, approach. Uh, uh, on, on the contrary, the idea is that uh, the, the selection of the project has been mostly driven by the extent to which the project can be uh, like would have not been funded uh, otherwise and taking the opportunity to uh, present and submit marginal projects which in my view is not the, the ideal uh, the ideal approach um, so I'm, I'm not particularly optimistic in that regard but maybe things will uh, uh, will change who knows yeah thank you thank you so thank much you. Also, also also because the the environmental benefits both in the short term and in the long term are, are quite difficult to to estimate so that could be another challenge thank you thank you okay thank you uh, alessandro and ricardo last uh, question uh, fatima uh, please yes hi thank you ricardo for this inspiring uh, lecture it was much more efficient than my morning coffee waking me up so when you mentioned about the importance of improving human capital and I was just wondering if you have looked into detail, like what's the best mix for success in terms of balance or diversity to, to maximize success, but not just like at project level, but also at regional level, because you highlighted several times that how important is it to have the, to, to improve the human capital for, for reaching success and impact of research projects. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't have the time to go in depth into the human capital uh, part of the story. Uh, we have done complementary work on, um, for example, the retention of human capital and the creation of human capital in less developed regions. Because if we think about less developed regions, it's not necessarily the problem of not having good human capital. On the contrary, you might have very good universities, amazing people, and then leave. So the problem is how do you retain human capital locally? And we looked, uh, uh, for example, at policies that try to give incentives for graduates to return to their regions of origin um, as, as, as the means to try and retain human capital who was trained in the region. Uh, we look at, 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 at funds that were given to people to study, abroad, to study abroad or in other regions and then come back. And the problem is that most people the, the, the largest impact of this type of tools were linked with uh, mismatch. So people ended up being super qualified and doing jobs that were not using their skill intensively. So they get very frustrated and at some point they left uh, in any case. So the key problem is that in order to deal with human capital, you really need um, a, a, a flexible and holistic approach that deals with supply and demand at the same time. So our key message was 
yes, you need to create incentives for individuals uh, to stay, for individuals to um, move uh, and remain in less developed regions. But if you don't work on the ecosystem of firms that will employ these individuals, for example, in their uh, uh, high uh, advanced skill intensive activities, it will be impossible to retain them. So it's really the problem of human capital needs to be seen as a wider uh, problem that involves both supply and demand at, at, at the same time. So finding the right mix is not easy. Like you said, it's not only an issue of uh, individual programs, but that's, again, something that we need to learn by looking at a wide range of programs implemented at the same time and see what is the right mix, not only in, for the feature of one program, but what is the right mix of programs that we need in order to deal with this uh, very, very difficult disease in, in, in less developed regions, that is the loss of human capital. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, so thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Ricardo. I would like to invite uh, all to uh, switch their camera uh, on so that we can see their, their faces and Ricardo can see all the, all the faces. Um, this session comes to an end right now. So I would like uh, in the end to, to thank again uh, Ricardo for his uh, very uh, insightful uh, uh, lecture. Uh, and I would, I would again stress this point uh, that uh, Ricardo, uh, I think he has showed how um, scientists can really contribute to, the, to shaping uh, future policy uh, concepts and, and instruments, uh, both with, uh, I would say, uh, general and more, uh, more general findings and recommendations, but, they, but these findings and recommendations are uh, underpinned uh, and supported by very robust, uh, very concrete uh, scientific, uh, uh, scientific evidence and scientific uh, work and, and analysis. So this is exactly the way that we uh, also at the, at the Joint Research Center try to, to work in order to, uh, to be as effective as policy in delivering science for uh, policy making. So thanks again, Ricardo. Thank you all. And, Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, Thank you and, all. And uh, good uh, continuation of this, uh, of this great day. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.